Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Thomas Insull, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist who served as the director of the National Institute of Mental Health from 2002 through 2015. Since May of 2019, he has been a special advisor to California Governor Gavin Newsom and chair of the board of the Steinberg Institute of Sacramento, California. Dr. Insel is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has received numerous national and international awards, including honorary degrees in the United States and Europe. He was a co-founder and past president of MindStrong, an online platform designed to deliver evidence-based therapy and psychiatry in structured, goal-oriented messaging sessions for individuals with serious mental illness. Dr. Insel is currently working to increase access to mental health treatment through his new venture, Nest Health, by providing remote, single session therapy, coupled with a peer support community. Dr. Insel, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you, delighted to be here, Bridget. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that brought you to the field of mental health? Well, I've been in this field a long time. I started as a psychiatrist coming out of medical school in the mid-70s, and that was a time when the community mental health system was alive and well in the United States and actually began working in community mental health center. That's where I got my initiation to what you could do for people by providing care that was not necessarily hospital-based, but had more of well, what we today would call intensive outpatient treatment. I went through the residency program in uh, San Francisco, which was very psychoanalytic. I did a Jungian analysis and then ended up making a turn in my career into research. So I moved to the National Institutes of Health and there really, for the first time, got a sense of how science could transform the way we think about mental illness and mental development and a whole range of aspects of how we control emotion and behavior. I worked for a while on obsessive compulsive disorder. I have to say by the mid 80s, I was pretty frustrated that we didn't have the tools that we needed to do the kind of research that I would have been interested in. So I shifted from doing clinical work to becoming a basic scientist. I actually changed careers completely and I spent the next 20 some years at the bench doing studies of the neurobiological basis of social behavior, especially attachment and maternal behavior, and working in a range of different species, including the lowly prairie vole, which was prior to that unheard of in the world of research. But we were very interested in Why do some animals become monogamous? Some species live in a solitary social structure. And What's different about the brains of those species? And through that, really began to understand the critical role of oxytocin and vasopressin, two neuropeptides uh, that had receptors in the brain that were really critical for social attachment. That whole part of my life came to an end about 20 years ago when I was asked to move to the directorship of the NIMH, which was a job I hadn't really thought about. I'd been so far away from medicine, public health, and clinical research for so long that uh, really I hadn't had much exposure to what had happened since I left the field in the early 80s. It was a little bit like Rip Van Winkle going back after 20 years of being asleep Um, And what I was surprised to find was that not much had changed in those 20 years. I had been in the world of neuroscience, which had gone through a profound revolution between 1982 and 2002. But the world of of mental health care, diagnosis and treatment was largely the same. There were many, many more drugs with names that I had to learn, but none of them were necessarily more effective or 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 even for that matter, more heavily adopted. It had been, I think, a golden era for the pharmaceutical industry, but it clearly wasn't making much of a difference in public health. It wasn't having much of an impact uh, for patients. NIH, National Institutes of Health, and NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, the part of it that I led, it was and still is a public health agency. And so there the questions are, what do you do to use science to make a difference for patients and families. And 
I spent the next 13 years um, managing that research endeavor and trying to understand how we could take the public funding and provide for the kind of science, support the kind of research that actually could lead to better outcomes. That was, of course, the era of genetics. It was the era of neuroscience. It was beginning to think about mental disorders as brain disorders and bringing a lot of different kinds of technologies to the question of uh, what causes schizophrenia, what's the development of the brain that leads some people to become depressed and others to become resilient, a whole range of issues around PTSD and, and autism and the whole gamut. I think for me, it was an extraordinary experience to learn uh, in a deep way about the science of the brain that could be supporting uh, the practice of therapy and of mental health care. But I have to say, a lot of that was exciting, but perhaps not impactful. And I became more and more concerned that while we were doing spectacular research, the suicide rate was climbing. The number of people with autism was increasing very significantly. The outcomes for people with schizophrenia were getting worse, not better. Um, and so as the years went on, I became more and more frustrated with the way that while the science was getting more intense and in some ways more elegant, the translation of that science to the needs of public health seemed to me to be getting even more remote. And so in 2015, I had an opportunity to leave to do something entirely different. So changed careers once again, moved to Silicon Valley, started working as an executive at, at Google, well, where we launched a new company called Verily to use digital tools and devices. So both software and hardware to try to change outcomes and to change the practice for a whole range of different areas of medicine, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and mental health as well. And in that case, what we were really trying to do was to build a closed loop system where we could use digital tools to understand changes in how people were thinking, feeling, behaving, and then close the loop by intervening on the same digital tools, mostly the smartphone, to try to figure out how to make a difference for people who were struggling the idea being that with 4 billion smartphones in circulation, and we'd gotten to a point where there were more phones than almost any other devices. You could find phones in areas where they didn't have access to clean water or sanitation. This was really a global opportunity. And so we uh, pursued that for a while. I moved from Google to MindStrong Health a few years ago, three years ago, and built out a company that was just focused on serious mental illness and doing the same kind of an approach with using technology for more continuous and ecological measurement and then providing interventions at the same time. And then most recently, had the opportunity to think even more broadly about what we can do using online services, and that became the, the birth of Nest Health. So Dr. Insel, I have recorded over 30 podcasts with many of the top experts and researchers in the field of mental health. The last question I ask all of them is, if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about the mental health system, what would it be? Many of them say emphatically, access to mental health treatment. It sounds as if you agree and that you've actually developed a solution. Can you talk about Nest Health and your plan for helping to solve the access dilemma? Oh, I'd love to talk about Nest Health, but I have to say that I don't know that the magic wand for me would be improving access. I, I do think that access is an issue, especially in the United States. But I think an equally important issue is quality. And that's one that hasn't gotten the kind of attention that it deserves. Again, I would say, especially in the United States, other countries have done a better job of this. So for me, those two things are equally important, providing access, but also access to high quality psychological services, high quality medical services. And Nest Health is partly all about that. It's saying, how can we make sure that people get access immediately, within minutes, to someone who is available with the kinds of training to be able to offer high-quality services, particularly psychotherapy, in the moment of need. 
So much of what we do is in the current mental health care system is at the moment of availability. It's when somebody has an open hour three weeks from now. That's not the way we practice medicine generally. Uh, If you have an acute problem, you end up going to an emergency room where you can be seen within minutes. Or nowadays, people increasingly go to a minute clinic or some other service that doesn't require a long delay. When people are struggling, there are moments when they finally realize, I need to do something about this. That's the moment when we should be able to meet them where they are and provide the services that make a difference for them. So Nest Health is, in a sense, a kind of minute clinic for behavioral health, but it's more than that. The other piece that we feel strongly about is that it's not just that kind of one-on-one experience, but that people need to get engaged in something that's more continuous. And so we provide a community that is an opportunity not only to get help, but to give help. Uh, And that community comes with lots of assets. You can think of it more maybe like Peloton for behavioral health. So it's Minute Clinic married to Peloton, where the Peloton piece involves everything from coaching to group sessions to the opportunity to help others so you become accountable and you have someone who's accountable for you. At the same time, there's still the opportunity to go back to get one-on-one support if you need it. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, providing remote access to mental health treatment is even more critical. Don't you agree? Well, there's no question that this has been the kind of black swan event for mental health care. It's clear that 95, 96% of outpatient care has shifted away from brick and mortar based therapy or brick and mortar based care to now being online. And that may be overdue. It could be that, especially in terms of the access question, uh, we should have done this years ago, that there should have been a way that people could see someone when they need remotely, using a phone, using Zoom, using whatever is available to them. That has happened. It's happened in a very brief time. So there's no question that COVID has been a game changer and that it's going to now raise the possibility that things may not go back when we're past the pandemic. The other thing I'd say is, and we're still trying to get a handle on this, is to what extent has COVID led to new people seeking treatment. We know this has been a remarkably stressful time between the uncertainty, the threat of getting of the virus, the social distancing, which has led people to not have either their routines or their supports that they're used to, and now the huge economic upheaval. This is an extraordinary moment where the mental health needs are likely to become sky high. We don't have good numbers for that yet, although I'm working with a group of 30 different digital health companies that are tracking this and trying to get a sense of how to put numbers on this, just the way we're tracking the virus and trying to get a sense of where is the pandemic going and where are the needs the greatest. Again, here we have this opportunity because people are accessing digital services and we can collect a huge amount of population-based information from those. It's a way of trying to understand where the needs are and what demographics do we need to target and what kind of support should we provide to make sure that we don't end up with a spike in suicide, a spike in psychosis, a spike in in disability. So this is, uh, without question, probably you know a generational experience, this pandemic. And of course, the possibility that We're still in the early days of this, makes many people think that in a way we are looking at both an infectious disease challenge, but even potentially a greater mental health challenge as we go forward because so many people's lives have been disrupted. So, what do you think are the barriers to providing remote mental health treatment? There are a few. Certainly, there is still a digital divide in the United States. I'd say that's true globally, but more in low- and middle-income countries. Of course, for mental health care, almost all countries are in that category. 
We're all developing countries when it comes to mental health care, but the United States, more than most of the rest of the developed world, has not done well to distribute the kinds of digital services that you would see, for instance, almost anywhere in Europe or most of Asia. So this digital divide means that some people don't have access. They don't have phones that can support the kind of interaction that we're talking about. They may not have broadband access. And we've seen this during the COVID pandemic that, you know, we've seen these vans that go around to provide mobile broadband access, which is super interesting and maybe a way forward here. In the United States, a lot of people who are homeless access the internet through their libraries, but with libraries being closed during the pandemic, that's really not an option. So this has revealed to the extent of the digital divide, and I think that is a problem. There's also an issue with a lot of providers not being comfortable with being able to provide remote care. Some people just don't like doing this. It's not what they've done for their whole careers. There are two other kinds of issues we have to think about. One is the the fact that some people indeed do need face-to-face services. That's what they're comfortable with, both on the provider side and on the client side. They are never going to be entirely at home with the idea of doing this in a remote fashion. There are others, by the way, for whom exactly the opposite is true. They will never be comfortable with face-to-face. It's overwhelming. For some people, and being able to do this remotely gives them a greater sense of agency and control. But the final thing is kind of as a policy wonk, I'm concerned about some of the regulatory issues. Don't think we have yet quite worked out all the issues of being able to have people reimbursed and even approved for giving telehealth remotely and We've seen some changes in this, of course, during the pandemic. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare services has said, uh, hey, we'll, we'll, we will reimburse for video conferencing and telehealth. But they haven't done that for audio, only for video. We need to look at that. And we still have states that have some archaic rules about how they will allow people to provide digital services. And it still is the case that even though the federal government has said it's okay, there are certain states that still limit access to telehealth, that it can only be done with providers who are in the same state or licensed in the same state as the client. I think that's changing very quickly and Perhaps in the next few weeks, we'll have that resolved. But those are issues we need to get our hands around as we enter what is really a brave new world for mental health care. Why do you think we can successfully perform mental health treatment remotely? Well, we can. It's interesting. We don't always perform successful mental health treatment face-to-face in brick and mortar. Most people don't accept that. More than 50% of people with mental health issues don't come for treatment. So we don't do too well on the face-to-face brick and mortar side of this, but remotely, I think we can do it. You know, and what's so interesting is that if you look across medicine where telehealth is now a booming industry, there's probably no part of medicine that is likely to be able to make this transition as well as mental health. We don't need to biopsy. We don't need surgical interventions. We don't have a lot of of very complicated devices. Most of what we do is listening and observing and talking and relating and connecting. All of that can be done through these remote opportunities. And I don't see any major barrier to doing the psychological interventions that we know work remotely, and even such opportunities as virtual reality therapy for phobias certainly can be done in that way. I I think we're just beginning to understand how to scale this and how to make it work, but there's no question that the research that's been done so far demonstrates the efficacy of being able to provide virtually every kind of evidence-based psychotherapy we know online. And even when you think about assessing your patients, sometimes you can see things even more clearly 
on a computer screen that you can then go back and rewind or maybe even zoom in. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So, and this gets to your next question about, you know, what am I so excited about? You know, I think one of the things that we have struggled with, and that may not even be the right verb, but one of the things we have failed at, maybe a better way to say this, in mental health care is measurement. Every other area of medicine has improved quality by uh, making sure that we measure and we measure with precision. So in diabetes, you look at blood glucose or hemoglobin A1C. In hypertension, you follow blood pressure. And you have those hard metrics to know when your treatments are working and when they're not. In the case of mental health, it's been much more subjective, which is important. But we've lacked any kind of objective measures. There may be an opportunity here to use digital tools to actually know whether somebody is sleeping, whether they are more active, whether they're more socially engaged, whether they're becoming depressed, whether they're more anxious, whether they're showing the first signs of psychosis. We have now the opportunity to do that through the tools that are baked into a smartphone, the kinds of data we can get from a wearable, from the power of machine learning and using data science and natural language processing to be able to really understand in detailed ways, in an ecological sense and in a continuous fashion, exactly how people are feeling, how they're behaving, how they're thinking. That's pretty extraordinary. And it, for the first time, gives us objective data that I think we can use to plan for interventions. So I'd now like to introduce Laura Gregorio, who is not only a licensed clinical social worker, but also Dr. Insel's daughter and the co-founder of Nest Health. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So can you describe how Nest Health works from a clinical perspective? Absolutely. I think it's bringing together some really key components that we know are pretty critical to health and wellness. And that includes sort of this community-based support where people can connect with other people just like them who have been through something similar. And then coupling that with this sort of on-demand access to -to one-to-one individual support. And those two components together really sort of cover all the bases in terms of providing immediate access to support from lots of different angles. Can you explain how you are utilizing technology to provide quality mental health treatment? Yeah, so it's really interesting. You know, my, my... career has sort of followed a winding path, but it's always sort of had this common theme of how do we provide care to people where they are, when they need it, in the way that they need it. And so I think technology really affords us the ability to do that in a whole new way. When you think about Amazon, Amazon really has this down to a science. They have one click buy, right? And so it's immediate access, one click away, We think about this with Netflix, with everything else. We don't wait for anything anymore. And in technology, we have what's called a funnel, which is the number of steps it takes to to get to something, to be able to do something. And we know that about we lose about 10% of people at every step in that funnel. And if you think about our traditional behavioral health system, it's about 27, 28 steps. And some of those are really big asks. So somebody identifies they have a need, they might have to Google what you know resources are available in their area. Maybe they have to play phone tag for a while. For somebody who's struggling, maybe even a little bit ambivalent about getting help, it's amazing that anybody actually ever makes it through that funnel and all the way to sitting face-to-face in front of a stranger, taking off time for work, transportation. Technology really allows us the ability to one or two clicks away provide care in an immediate fashion um, and really kind of takes out all of those barriers that we see in a traditional system. And then you couple that with the quality control that you can bake in. And you know, Dr. Insel was talking about this a little bit, but the quality control you, you can bake in when you're putting this all on a technological platform. There's really no type of quality assurance in our traditional care. When somebody goes into a therapist's office and that door closes, what happens there is nobody's measuring that, nobody's tracking that. There's no real goals over time necessarily. And there's no 
sort of ensuring that progress is being made. But that's something you can kind of do seamlessly when you're putting it all through technology. You said where they are. And I think about that phrase and I think about where people are now. I mean, when we think about social work, we think about communities. That's a very social work sort of idea. But where they are now is often online communities. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So people are largely seeking help right now in places like Facebook forums, Reddit, different online communities where, you know, they are going for peer support, right? They're going to connect with other people who have been through something. Maybe they want to get some information from people who have been where they have, who have struggled with some of the problems. The problem with that is that those platforms are not designed with any kind of mental health vetting in any way, shape, or form. And the likelihood of somebody getting bad, misinformed, harmful advice or feedback is very high. And there's nobody ensuring that the information that's being shared there is actually helpful. And so providing a safe community online where there is some clinical vetting and there is some quality assurance in the feedback that's being provided is it's really kind of a novel concept. So can you tell me what some of the mental health disorders nest health would be appropriate to treat? So it's kind of more about what's not appropriate. It's funny when we think about on-demand access to care, right? That you automatically sort of think about this could be crisis oriented and we're really not looking at this being a crisis service per se. However, I think what it is really perfect for is capturing motivation. One thing that we know about motivational interviewing or behavior change is that you want to capture somebody in that moment when they're motivated. And that moment when they're motivated might be at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon when there is nothing else open. And they've decided in that moment, it's really time to take a change in their lives, to, to change a behavior or stop a maladaptive coping mechanism, whatever it may be. And if you don't capture that in the moment on four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, if their first appointment is three weeks from now, or even if they have a regular therapist who they see at Tuesdays at two, you've probably just missed that window of opportunity. And so Next Health says, if you're ready right now, so are we. And we'll be here with you. We'll have your back. We'll guide you. Nest Health's approach to clinical service delivery is very solution focused. The single session model, sort of one at a time support is about being for you, in, being there for you in that moment when you're really motivated to make a change. And together we'll approach your issue, your challenge, your obstacle in a collaborative fashion to be very action-oriented. So you'll come in with something you're wanting to tackle and along with your counselor or therapist will really help you to come up with an action plan in that moment about what steps you're going to take so that by the time you leave that single session, you'll know what your next steps are to really tackle that problem. And so being able to address a problem in the moment of need and not necessarily on that crisis spectrum, but really about motivation and, and willingness to change behaviors. And, and that's where the Peloton model or parallel is, is a really kind of fitting one because what Peloton does is that they tap into behavior change goals. They help people set behavior change goals. And then they empower individuals with metrics to track, to, to really see if people are working towards their goals, if they're getting stuck, if there's sort of some stagnation in that progress, that can be part of the game plan. That can be part of how you tackle it. And at Nest Health, we then provide you an additional single session. You're not making the progress you had anticipated toward your goal that you had set. Let's jump back in and see what's happening there. That makes a lot of sense. Are there any disorders that you would not want to treat using this platform? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not a crisis platform. It's not for severe chronic mental illness. This is really about targeting specific goals. It's about looking for exceptions to the problem rather than focusing on the problem. And so that's that can be a little bit harder to do for people in a very chronic illness where it's harder to treat in sort of this way that might be where people have sort of have episodic issues 
that may be easier to treat with this model than somebody who has a very kind of chronic long-standing problem. So how is suicide risk managed? We do have an entire escalation protocol for, say, our peer workers or our mental health workers who are non-licensed professionals, where they can escalate something that they feel uncomfortable with or where they feel like there may be some risk involved. They can then escalate that to a licensed provider on our platform who is trained then on how to manage and contain that situation, either through de-escalating the crisis or doing a warm handoff to another more appropriate service. Can you talk about the peer support part of the Nest Health platform? Absolutely. I think there's a couple key things that really make this a very powerful type of intervention. One is that when you think about in our traditional care system, the stepped care model, our very first step in that care, when people first identify that they would like to get mental health care in some way, shape, or form, the very first thing is once a week, individual therapy for an hour with a licensed therapist, usually $150, $200 a session. That's a really big leap. That's not a step. That's a leap from nothing to that. And so peer support, what it does is it provides kind of a whole framework and a safety net and a whole other layer of support before you get to the one-to-one individual therapy. Because quite frankly, not everybody needs that level of care. We think of that as kind of the lowest level of care, but it's still a pretty high level of care for some folks. And some people really just need to talk to somebody else who's been there, somebody who's been trained in some basic counseling skills. And there's some power in sort of this ability to crowdsource some of these skills, because what we know and what the evidence shows is that helping somebody else is actually just as beneficial as seeking help yourself. In fact, it may even be more effective. So when we arm an entire community with very basic counseling skills and people use that on each other and help one another to reframe certain situations or help people to seek solutions, they're also at the same time really helping themselves through practicing skills that are applicable for themselves just as much as they are for somebody else. So really, it works in multiple different dimensions, and it provides a scale of access that you will never be able to get if we stick to really only talking to licensed professionals. So the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing many clinicians who may not have been comfortable with technology to provide online counseling services in order to treat their clients. What do you think are the elements that go into making telebehavioral health more successful from the therapist's perspective? You know, I am going to answer this question in a way that I think is not expected. (laughs) What we learned at a previous company that I worked for, where we did a lot of online support, and I managed and supervised about 165 licensed therapists to provide online therapy. And what we actually found was that the online therapy care delivery allows for a type of humanity that you might not see otherwise. I feel like typically therapists are sort of put on this pedestal as being the expert. As being somehow, you know, therapists are sort of seen as superhuman in the clinical setting oftentimes. And I think what happens, and we're seeing this happening now in the in the era of COVID, where suddenly our news reporters, right, are We can see their households. We can see the background. They suddenly become human to us. And there's something about that access and that warmth and that tangible human quality that I think is lacking sometimes in clinical services. You know, I know we're trained in a lot of clinical settings and a lot of clinical training programs train about how much self-disclosure to do and whether that's appropriate, where it's appropriate, when it's appropriate. But I feel like in this time of sort of absolute existential crisis, this, this sense of isolation and loneliness that everyone is feeling, being able to connect from one person's couch to another, see that human quality of therapists coming to you from their own home, I believe actually one of the magic secret sauces of what we can do with 
behavioral health that we shouldn't take away. I think there's something really powerful in that human connection during these times of, of such isolation. I wanted to go back to both of you with some concluding questions. The first one is, what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? Dr. Insel, would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I think technology is a game changer. And I do think that in this field, moving to the power of uh, what you can do with this combination of really exquisite measurement, we sometimes call that digital phenotyping, but even just getting measurement-based care, getting people to help track their own progress is critically important. And then closing the loop by providing in-the-moment care. Uh, I just think that's extraordinary. And being able to do this in a way that, as I said, was democratized. That is, we can provide the very same care in Botswana that we provide in Boston. That has not been the case in the past. So this is an opportunity for really a global mental health movement that could look very different over the next decade than what we've seen for the last several decades. So I want to circle back to something that Dr. Insel said earlier around quality, that technology allows us to have a quality of care uh, that we haven't seen before. And I actually would want to specify that quality does not necessarily need to be defined by what's going to reduce cost for health insurance companies, what's going to, how are we going to decrease somebody's score on the PHQ-9? How are we going to decrease symptoms? In my mind, I'm very excited about thinking about how do we provide the consumer, the client, what they really want and need. In our Nest Health single session approach, the beginning of the session is always going to start with, if today's session gave you exactly what you needed, what would that look like? And how can you walk out of here knowing you got what you needed out of today's session? And I feel like that's just not something we ask very often. And so I'm really excited about how do we give the consumer what they want? The first session shouldn't be an intake and a history and the client leaves having gotten absolutely nothing out of that. I really am excited and looking forward to really turning the table on how do we deliver care and who are we delivering the care for? One of the things that has been so interesting as we've started to think about what we should provide in a new service like Nest Health is when we looked at psychotherapy and how it's delivered. I don't think I'd ever really thought about this, but it turns out that the modal number of therapy sessions that people get is one. Now, that's probably not exactly accurate, probably closer to zero. But for those who do go, most people only go once. So it begs the question, if you're only going to have a single session, how do you make that work for someone? How do you give them something in that hour? And it could be a full hour. That actually is a solution or helps them to understand that whatever that solution that they need is, that's something that they can have within them already. We, ha we have a kind of saying that our approach is about what's strong, not what's wrong. So helping people to recognize the strengths and recognize what they can do with what they bring into the session that is a very different approach. And I think that's exciting to understand that even in a single session, people can walk away with something that they can find quite useful to begin to work on themselves. Tack on to that. I would add that it's not that we only have one hour. We have a whole hour to get somebody what they need. I was thinking, kind of bringing together what both of you are saying, I wonder if since the first session is only about assessment and not really about solution or connection, oftentimes, I'm not saying all the time, but maybe that's why we're not having more than a single session. And I think those are questions that can be asked, yes. right? That's, that's what really tap into that quality piece of, did you get what you needed today? Mm -hmm. And if someone didn't get what they needed, they're not coming back. <laughs> right? And then you lost that. So if you couple the give it to them when they need it with give them what they're needing mm -hmm. <laughs> and you put those pieces together, it seems so simple. And yet it's something we've never done before in this field, which is just so mind-blowing, right? 
Well, it kind of goes back to what Dr. Insel said in the beginning, where you were talking about earlier, Dr. Insel, not much had changed over those 20 years. Right. Yeah. No, I don't think, you know, we, we have lots of boutique therapies, CBT, DBT, CPT. I mean, there's just a long list of, of these acronyms, but it's still the case that when you look at overall outcomes, even though more people are getting more treatments than ever before, our outcomes at a population basis are worse, not better. And we have to ask ourselves as we go forward, do we just want to keep doing more of the same? Or is this the time to say, let's try something very different? So my next question, Dr. Insel, is if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? Well, I would go, kind of following up on Laura's comment, I would go after the quality question. And the quality question requires really three things. It's you've got to have training of the workforce. It doesn't have to be a professional workforce, but it has to be a workforce that's trained to do the stuff that works. And we have a lot of that, right? We have a lot of things that work. The second is you have to measure. So you've got to be able to know when it's working, when it isn't, and titrate accordingly. We do that everywhere else in the case of of, of the healing arts. That's the, the fundamental is you measure outcome and you respond accordingly. We don't do that here. And then the third area is there's got to be some continuity and some integration. I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made in this field when I look back and say, why haven't we done better when we have so much good stuff to offer? I think the answer is that we've kind of been victims of magical thinking. We keep thinking that for complex problems, there's a simple solution. There's going to be a drug. There's going to be an interpretation. There's going to be a device. And there's probably not going to be a simple solution for problems of living and problems of of the brain, which is a pretty complex organ. But we have to begin pulling things together, integrating, and realizing that you have to network this. You know, you've got to, to really improve quality. You've got to be able to offer people a range of things that will be helpful. And different people need different kinds of assets. And so we've got to think about how do you put that together and how do you make sure those things are available with high quality and given over time. I would echo what Dr. Insel has just said. I completely agree along all of those lines. So Dr. Insel and Laura, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you have helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand Nest Health. Thank you. Thank you. Be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.